Good morning, Nexus. I am out looking for a location to shoot for my sermon today, and I come across this. I'm out in the middle of nowhere. It cracked me up, though, so I had to stop and do an initial greeting from here. I love this. Oh, my goodness. Wash your hands and say your prayers because Jesus and germs are everywhere. <laughs> what? Oh, my. Well, I'll say this. We don't have a church sign at Nexus, gratefully, so we don't have to put up corny signs like this, but... We do have some announcements to make. Staying connected during COVID and during this fall is not gonna be easy, but one of the things that we want to do is continue on with Boomerang groups online. And so that's what we're going to do. And I wanna focus on one this morning that's starting this Thursday night, Murray and Jane are hosting, and it's about Jesus. There's 12, bloody motorcycle. I forget where I was. Oh my goodness, I got just pushed off. Now I'm rattled by that motorbike. And that loud car, he just intentionally sped up. I know he did, I could see it. Anyway, this boomerang group is all about at how Jesus shows us who God is, but also how Jesus shows us how we can live life well. So if that sounds like something of interest to you, please sign up. It would be great to stay connected with some of you. It's this Thursday night. You can read more about it in the Nexus Weekly or talk to Murray and Jane. For those of you who have been tuning in online, I just wanna say thank you. I know so many of you are still following on online. My Aunt Shelly is even still following along. Hi, Aunt Shelly. I know there's some of you in Barrie. Uh, there's others of you all kind of around uh, Southern Ontario here, and I'm just so grateful that you're tuning in and watching these week by week. So I'm going to uh, try to drive on and find a little uh, quieter place to do my sermon. So off we go, but good morning and thanks for joining us this morning. Well, good morning, Nexus folk. I can't wait to jump in this morning. Uh, I've picked some farmer's field out in the middle of nowhere and I'm wondering if I've made a mistake. Uh, there's a lot of cars and trucks going by, but I've landed on location. So we're going with it. Car. Pickup truck to be exact. Anyway, here we go. A coincidence is a surprising concurrence of events perceived as meaningfully related with no apparent causal connection. Last week I told us some stories that some of us folk might call coincidences. The question is, or was, is there a meaning to them? Is there a meaning behind seeing two rainbows in the sky or discovering a dollar bill with your girlfriend's name on it or, or narrowly escaping a doomed flight? We humans are meaning-seeking creatures. We like to ascribe meaning where there may not even be any. But we humans are also a skeptical lot of folk, aren't we? And perhaps we're sometimes too quick to dismiss how mysterious and magical our world really is. In the end, when it comes to stories of coincidences, I love how Sarah Koenig sums it up this way. She says, Things happen in life and we know deep down that we could probably explain them away with statistics and probability charts, but there's just a poetry to things like this when they happen. There's some kind of beauty in it. There's meaning in the noticing of it at all. I love that line. There's a poetry and beauty to the mysterious and peculiar events of life. And, and whether the events themselves mean something or not, in and of themselves, I'm not sure, but I am inclined, as I said last week, to say the meaning is in the noticing. And yet alone that seems insufficient. And so this morning I want to add two lines to that phrase, the meaning is in the noticing. I want to add two things to that. The meaning is in the noticing, but if we look hard enough, I'm inclined to think that, that what we find in noticing moments that give us pause, there's, there's something more. So let me tell you a story. Eric Gordon was living in Oakland, California in 1994 when he decided to go on a camping trip with one of his friends. And as he and his friend are heading south on Highway 101, his friend starts to frantically shout, look, look, Eric, look. And she's pointing over into this field, but right as Eric turns his neck to see what she's pointing at, they go through an overpass, Eric completely misses it, and his excited friend blurts out, Eric, you missed it. There was a goat standing on a cow's back. 
Eric was immediately skeptical. I mean, the thought of a goat standing on a cow seemed absurd, and so he voiced his doubts, but his friend insisted there was a goat on top of a cow. Moreover, she insisted Eric pull over and back up so you can see it, but of course, this is a busy highway, so that's not a great idea. So the friends argue back and forth for a few moments until finally Eric relents as they're cruising down the highway to go back and see it. And so he pulls off an exit and turns around, drives back the other way, down the other side of the highway, gets off an exit there, turns back around and pulls up beside the field. It's been about 20 minutes since the first spotting. And sure enough, there it is, a goat standing on the back of a cow. Amazed, the two friends just sit there silently observing this peculiar sight. And for the two animals, it almost just seemed natural for the two of them. Every time the cow took a step to graze on another piece of grass, well, the goat just shifted from side to side, balancing right on top of the cow's back. And the sight is so strange that they decide, you know what, let's try to get even closer. And so slowly they get out of the car, but the moment they shut the car door, bam, the goat jumps off of the cow. Disappointed, they just stand there perfectly still, waiting, hoping that maybe, just maybe, the goat will jump back up on top of the cow. But it is right at that moment that Eric notices something else, something at his feet. It's a letter. Right in front of the fence separating them from the goat and the cow, and so the friends pick it up and they notice immediately this letter is old, like very old, must be at least 50 years old. And the envelope is crisp and brown and it's postmarked 1952. And opening it together, they begin to read the first few lines of the letter, but then out of the corner of their eye, they notice another letter and then another and another and another. All along the fence next to the goat on the cow, there are letters all over the place, seemingly been blown away all down the side of the highway. The two friends start hastily beginning to pick up all these letters and they're shouting at each other the dates that are postmarked on the envelopes. There's letters from the 1920s, there's letters from 1937, 1897, 1890. There are letters everywhere. In total, Eric and his friend pick up over 300 letters, and as they start looking through all of them, they notice that they're all addressed to the same person, Ella Chase. What started out as two friends noticing a goat on a cow turned into friends standing in the middle of somebody's whole life correspondence spread out on the side of Highway 101. And having gathered all the letters they could find, the two just sit there in their car, flipping through these letters, all of them made out to Ella Chase. That day in 1994, after noticing a goat on a cow, it was the start of Eric's obsession with getting behind these letters to Ella Chase. These letters became Eric's favorite thing in the whole world. He kept them stored in a closet in this archival box. Ella Chase. Eric would learn a whole lot about her reading through these letters. At least 40 of them were written to her from boys in the Navy, and these Navy guys had a penchant for calling her mom. Here's a letter dated from April 2nd, 1941, from a GI named W. Murphy. He writes this, Well, Mom, I hope you don't mind me calling you this because you are a mother to me, and I hope you can, I can be seeing you again. Keep writing to me if you will. I sure enjoyed hearing from you. Hope you received the letter that I wrote a few days ago, but mail is a little slow coming and going out here. I'm feeling fine, only a little tired, but that's nothing unusual as we are pretty busy all the time. Well, Ma, I better close and say a prayer for me if you will, and God bless you. Love, W. Murphy. There were 40 of these letters, each from different World War II soldiers who seemed to have become attached to Ella as a sort of matriarchal figure, a mum. And many of the soldiers, it seemed, had never actually met her, but this Ella Chase, whoever she was, she, she seems to have become this community pillar, a matriarch to these people. And as Eric keeps reading through these letters, what all of them seem to showcase, be it from soldiers or other correspondence she had with people in her town, everyone seemed to have a profound reverence for Ella. So many of the letters end with, I'm so grateful for you, Ella, or, or thank you so much for what you did for me, Ella. 
I mean, Eric's enthralled, but there's so many details to the story that are murky. He knows that Ella was married, but he can't figure out when she was married or who she's married to. He knows that Ella ran for political office, but he has no idea what office she ran for. All Eric knows is that he stumbled across hundreds of letters written to what seems to be a most fascinating woman. For years, try as he might, Eric could not figure out who this woman was. Over the years, he would do his research, but he became increasingly unsettled. How did this woman who seemed to touch so many people's lives, how did her life seem to end up on the side of a highway? The question wouldn't go away for Eric, and so, so Eric eventually sought out the help of two journalists to help him track down any of her family that these letters might be meaningful to and their search would end up taking them across the country. They head to a historical society. They check census records. They spend days in libraries searching through newspaper microfilm, looking for obituaries or news stories that might connect to her name, but they're not having any luck. They can't find any leads, and for months their search goes on until eventually they find Ella's obituary. It turns out Ella Chase had actually passed on Monday, July 4th, 1950. And scanning through her obituary, they're looking for any names they could try to connect with. And there they find this name, Robert Lyle, her grandson. Now eventually they find a phone number connected to him, but after leaving messages and not hearing from him for weeks, they decide to move on and keep pursuing other things, and the more they dig into her life, the more mysterious it becomes. There's a cruel divorce that ends up leaving Ellie penniless. There's an alcoholic husband who drinks himself to death. Searching and searching, though, they can't seem to find anyone who might find these letters meaningful to them. All they know is that while Ella's life had moments of pain and trauma and struggle, for scores of people, for scores of soldiers, this woman had felt like a mom. Writing hundreds of letters of encouragement and support, it seemed tragic to Eric and this team of journalists that, that such a woman's story would end by the side of a highway road. Her story seemed doomed to be a mystery with no resolution. But then, a phone call. Robert Lyle, or Bob, grandson of Ella Chase had accidentally erased the phone messages that they had left and he couldn't get a hold of them for some time but eventually he was able to track down Eric and the researchers and and what he told them was a wild story. You see Bob had moved 12 years ago from San Jose to South California and while making the move Bob had boxes of Ella's letters and they were all making the move in the back of his pickup truck and suddenly while on the highway a gust of wind had blown an entire box out of the back of the pickup truck spreading these letters all across the highway. Bob immediately pulled over and he and his wife frantically tried to recover all the letters that were now being blown off the highway but as he was collecting them in a panic the California Highway Police pulled over and told him that he had to get back in his truck and keep moving. Bob pleaded with them, but the police told him they would give him a ticket for littering if he didn't move on. He had to get back in his truck and keep going. Now, Bob was devastated, but what else could he do? Pleading one more time, he was sternly told, get back in your car and keep moving. And so reluctantly, he did. Pain that he, he had to lose so many of his grandmother's letters. You see, Bob had spent years chronicling Ella's life, going through these boxes of letters. And now, for Bob, there would always be one piece of the puzzle missing. Little did he know that just two hours after the police forced him to move on, two friends drive by the exact spot where Bob lost those letters, and they notice a goat on a cow. Now, they could have kept driving, but like Moses last week, they decided to turn aside and see this marvelous sight. And while noticing the goat on the cow, they also notice letters strewn across a fence beside a highway, hundreds of them. Noticing 
they decide to pick them up, and, and Eric spends 12 years of his life trying to find who these letters might be meaningful to. 12 years searching for Ella Chase's family, and now, finally, he had found them. When Eric happily returned the box of letters to Bob, it was the start of a, an interesting relationship. Bob, in turn, sent Eric boxes of Ella's letters so that he could continue diving through them and exploring Ella's life. The two even remain in touch today, both of them fascinated by the mystery and the legacy of this woman named Ella Chase, the mum to many. But think of it all. It all started with two friends noticing a goat on a cow. It all started with two friends who decided to turn aside to see this marvelous sight. It all started when someone noticed a goat on the back of a cow. Last week I told you the meaning is in the noticing, and this week I want to add two lines to that phrase. I want to take us further. Yes, the meaning is in the noticing, but the noticing comes with an invitation, and God is always present and at work within the invitation. What do I mean by that? I mean, consider the stories I told you last week. You see, with those stories, predominantly our questions become about where is God in those stories? Did God make those two rainbows appear for double rainbow man? Did God make that dollar bill arrive in Paul's hand? Did God cause Elise O'Kane to miss her doomed flight? And of course, those are interesting questions to be sure, but, but for me, maybe they're the wrong questions. Maybe we're looking for God in the wrong place. We're looking for God in the cause when maybe God is found in the invitation. You see, if we go looking for God and causes, we're always going to find ourselves trapped up by these difficult life questions. Whether God is the cause of events, I honestly don't know. But what I'm confident of is this, God is in the invitation. And the invitation comes with noticing. Two friends notice a goat on a cow, and they decide to turn aside and give it attention. There's the meaning itself, that they stopped, noticed, that is the point, but, but when they did, what they found was more. What they found was an invitation. Letters strewn across a fence. They pick them up and read them, and they have a decision to make. An invitation awaits them. Do they engage? Do they go looking for who these letters might belong to, or do they just let them blow away? Do they stop and engage, or do they just move on? The meaning, yes, is in the noticing, but the noticing always comes with an invitation. I mean, consider the ways that this plays out in Scripture. Think about Moses wandering around in the desert when he notices an unusual sight. There's a burning bush, but it's not consumed. And of course, he decides to turn aside and go and see it, right? The meaning is that he noticed it. The noticing itself becomes holy ground. Look what happens as he approaches the bush. When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, Here I am. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. The noticing itself is holy ground. By noticing, Moses has entered into the realm of the sacred, but that is not all. Within this holy ground of perception, Moses receives an invitation. Here it is. The Lord said, I've indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I've heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I'm concerned about their suffering. So I've come down to rescue them from the hands of the Egyptians. Now the cry of the Israelites has reached me, and I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now, go. I'm sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. By noticing at all, Moses enters into the realm of the sacred and the holy. But once in that space, an invitation comes to him. There are people I want to liberate, Moses, and I want you to participate. I want to send you to be a part of that. The meaning is in the noticing, but the noticing comes with an invitation, and God is always at work and present within the invitation.
Or notice this story in scripture. In the book of Acts, Peter, he's going to pray. And while he goes to pray, he has this sort of goat on a cow moment. He falls into this sort of trance. And while he's praying, he sees or notices something. And he steps into holy ground. This is how the story plays out. Peter fell into a trance. He saw or noticed heaven opened and something like a large sheet being let down to earth by its four corners. It contained all kinds of four-footed animals as well as reptiles and birds. Then a voice told him, get up, Peter, kill and eat. Surely not, Lord, Peter replied. I've never eaten anything impure or unclean. The voice spoke to him a second time. Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. This happened three times and immediately the sheet was taken back to heaven. And then this line, while Peter was wondering about the meaning of the vision. Oh, I love this. I love this. Peter's eyes are opened. He notices this goat on a cow moment and he attends to the moment. He's given a vision and he's left wondering, what does it mean? This is like Paul Vasquez with the double rainbows. What does it mean? The meaning Peter is in the noticing. But look at what happens next. Next comes the invitation. And the invitation is where God is always present and at work. While Peter was wondering about the meaning of the vision, the men sent by Cornelius found out where Simon's house was and stopped at the gate. They called out asking if Simon, who was known as Peter, was staying there. And while Peter was still thinking about the vision, the Spirit said to him, Simon, three men are looking for you. So get up and go downstairs. Do not hesitate to go with them, for I have sent them. I mean, this story is one of the most pivotal moments in the early church's history. Cornelius, the one looking for Peter, is a Gentile. And at that time, they were not believed to be a part of God's big redemptive story. They were outsiders. They were unclean. Gentiles were not welcome on Jesus' path. And then Peter has this goat on a cow moment this strange, bizarre dream about forbidden food and eating it, and and Peter's wondering what it means. And then the invitation comes. There's a Gentile looking for you, Peter. Don't hesitate to go. I'm inviting you to extend Jesus' path to those outside the walls and boundaries of faith. The meaning is in the noticing, but the noticing comes with an invitation, and God is always present and at work in the invitation. I mean, consider the stories I shared last week. They all noticed something. The meaning was in the noticing, but see how each each, uh, situation comes with an invitation as well. I mean, for Double Rainbow Man, he's overwhelmed by beauty, right? So what is the invitation there? Well, there could have been plenty. I mean, maybe those rainbows sort of stir something within him, maybe make resolution with his ex-wife or kids, who knows? But at the bare minimum, the invitation prompted him to share his experience online. The invitation was at least to share his joy And he did. And over 50 million of us have benefited from that. We've watched his experience. It it made us laugh. It gave us joy. It gave us a peek into what it means to allow yourself to be truly moved. I mean, that video to me is just complete gift. Or what about Paul and Esther Groshan, right? Paul notices the dollar bill and and to notice it at all is the meaning, but the, the noticing comes with an invitation. Paul's looking down at this dollar bill, wondering if he should get more serious with his girlfriend, Esther, and staring at that dollar bill, there's an invitation for him. An invitation to move into greater love, trust, commitment, fidelity. He is invited into a deeper and more meaningful experience of love. Or think about Elise O'Kane. She notices just profoundly how lucky she is to have narrowly escaped a doomed flight and that noticing comes with an invitation. You see the rest of Elise O'Kane's story is this. She ended up changing professions. Overwhelmed by the circumstances that led her to not being on that flight, she felt invited to give her life to service service of others and so she ended up becoming a nurse wanting to spend her life helping those who are sick and suffering. The meaning is in the noticing, but the noticing comes with an invitation and God is always at work and present in the invitation. But where does that leave us? 
I mean, chances are we're not gonna stumble into some double rainbows or find a dollar bill with someone's name on it or missed a doomed flight or, or notice a goat on a cow by the side of the road or find hundreds of old letters strewn across the highway. I mean, those sorts of things are great stories, but they don't happen to people like us, not normally. But you see, faith is a matter of perception. And I'm here to tell you this morning that there are goats on cows everywhere. If our eyes are wide open with wonder and awe, for those of us with eyes to see, what we'll find is that there are goats on cows all over the place. Let me give you one example. Consider relationships. Now, Melissa Bowman sent me an article this week about the work of Dr. John Gottman. Now, I've always found his work incredibly profound because what he does is he studies relationships and marriages. He, he studies to see what relational attributes are predictors of relational success or failure. And what he has found is that relationships that work best are ones where people notice goats on cows, you could say. Hang with me a moment. You see, Gottman's research tends to follow couples from the day of their marriage all the way over the course of five to 10 years. And during that time, of course, many couples remain married. Others, of course, end in divorce. And Gottman insists that the couples who stay together are always better at one thing, what he calls turning towards instead of away. It's kind of like Moses with the burning bush, Moses deciding to turn and go investigate this strange site. Turning aside, Moses does. It's the same sort of thing Gottman says. In his study, he noted that couples who stayed married tend to turn towards one another 86% of the time. Couples that ended up divorced only averaged to do that 33% of the time. The secret to relational success, Gottman says, is turning towards our partner. But what does that mean? What Gottman suggests is that within relationships, we are often what he calls bidding for our partner's attention. Gottman calls a bid this, any attempt from one partner to another for attention, affirmation, affection, or any other positive connection. And this is true with marriage partner, it's, it's true with children, it's true with friends, it's true with people in our community. And these bids, they happen in very simple ways. Let me give you a few examples. Let's say my wife Kristen walks in the door after getting home from work and says, oh, well, today was a rough one. Or let's say she says, hey, do you wanna find a TV show to watch together? Or maybe she says, hey, Brad, what are you reading? You see, a bid can be a simple comment or question. It can be a gesture. It can even be the look in our eye. But these bids are the ways that we look for connection. And in relationships, I would call these bidding moments goat on the cow moments. Life, you could say, is kind of like Eric traveling down the highway. And throughout our days, there are moments when, when life screams at us, look, look, a goat on a cow. And the question is, what do we do? Do we turn around? Do we pull over? Do we, like Moses, turn aside and pay attention? And so when Kristen says to me, oh, today was rough, if I look at it as a goat and a cow moment, I'm going to turn aside and give my attention to that. But I could also just ignore it and carry on doing what I'm doing. Or when Kristen says, hey, do you want to find a TV show to watch together? I can see that as a bid for connection and intimacy and explore and give my attention to that. Or of course, I can ignore it and watch my better TV shows, you know? Or if Kristen says, what are you reading? That's an invitation into what I'm learning, what I'm doing. So I can follow through with that, turn aside and pay attention, or I can ignore it and say, oh, nothing interesting. And so these moments throughout our days in relationships is just one area alone, but these moments in our days, they're goats on cows. You know, last week, some of you told me that you were a little bit confused when I said the meaning is in the noticing. I mean, what does that mean, that the meaning's in the noticing? Well, I would say this, relationally, and this is just one aspect of life, but relationally, these sorts of bids we're talking about, they come and go virtually every single day. And we can live our lives never noticing that people are looking for connection and intimacy. But the moment you truly notice what little questions and bids like these are really all about, well, you've already found the meaning. I can see my wife's questions as a bid 
for attention, a desire for intimacy, or I can just miss it and drive on by. And so when Kristen says, that was a tough day, I can choose to say, wow, I think this is a goat on a cow, I better pull over. When she says, what are you reading? I can choose to see that as a goat on the cow, I better pull over. But the moment we decide to give our attention, to to turn aside from whatever else is going on, we have found the meaning. We're standing on holy ground. The meaning is in the noticing. And the noticing comes with an invitation and God, I'm inclined to think, is always present and always at work within the invitation. Or consider Peter's story. He has this confusing goat on a cow vision, trance-like dream about forbidden food hanging in front of him. And while he's wondering about that, the next moment the person standing at his door is the last person someone like him wants to see, a Gentile. I mean, picture the most annoying person in the world or the kind of person you don't like or, or whoever that is for you. Maybe it's just the kind of person that you don't want to give your attention to. But, but for Peter, that person is now standing on his doorstep and Peter realizes he's had a goat on a cow experience. And the invitation comes, go with him. How many times have we found someone in front of us we'd rather not be with? How many times have we had a person in front of us and we just don't feel like we have the energy for them? How many times has someone been standing in front of us and we're just not really there? We're not present with them. And like Eric's story, we could keep driving or we could choose to say, you know what? Maybe this person in front of me, maybe this is a goat on the cow moment. I think I better pull over. I better turn aside and give my attention to them. And the moment we notice that and wake up to that, the meaning is there. We will be standing on holy, sacred ground because when you truly see these moments, truly notice them, they are sacred. But remember, the noticing always comes with an invitation and God is always present and at work within the invitation. And so here's what I want to do as this series unfolds. What I want to do is examine why we so often miss these moments, why we so often fail to see God at work in our world. I want to showcase for us why I believe we so often miss seeing goats on cows, why we so often miss seeing the magic and mystery in life. And of course, how I think we can try to recover that to make our world more enchanted than we ever thought possible, living with eyes wide open and ready to find our goat on a cow. For now, for today, for this week, may the light in your eyes remain ablaze, ready to see goats on cows are everywhere. The meaning is in the noticing. But the noticing will come with an invitation and God is always present and at work there.
Friends, thanks for joining us this morning. I hope you're enjoying the stories. I love telling them. I love sort of pairing all this stuff together. I'm having a riot out trying to film out in whoever, I don't even know where I am. But uh, I'm loving this and I hope you're enjoying it too. So thanks for your time. Thanks for your presence here this morning. And uh, I hope you're having a wonderful Thanksgiving weekend, doing it however we're supposed to do it this weekend. But whoever you're with, may you have a wonderful Thanksgiving and uh, go in peace.